The Last Guardian may very well be my favorite game of 2016, and it's a good contender for my game of the decade. I don't cry a lot when playing games or watching movies, and if I do, it's usually only games like The Beginner's Guide, with their subtext making me get all introspective about the way I've gone about my life up until that point. I still get choked up whenever I hear that credits song. I just about never cry at the literal events of a work of fiction, but by the time I was wrapping up The Last Guardian, Tadiko didn't feel like fiction. I can absolutely understand why this game didn't do it for a lot of people, but I think my combination of love for animals, love for puzzle-driven walking sims, and childlike wonder for unique game design and powerful technology made me the perfect audience for this game. The rest of those factors are self-explanatory, but let's take a look at that first one, a love for animals. I'm sure some of you have noticed that I sometimes gravitate towards a linear look at a game, and other times I just cherry-pick especially poignant moments and arrange them however I see fit. Well, the reason I sometimes go linear is because some games are absolutely genius with how they drip-feed you information about the story and gameplay, and I don't want that to be lost in translation. The Last Guardian is one of those games, so this is going to be a mostly linear look at it. That being said, let's go ahead and call this spoiler territory, as my blind playthrough of this game was beautiful in every sense of the word. Throughout the entirety of The Last Guardian, the illusion that Tadiko was a living, breathing, and above all else unpredictable animal wasn't broken once. Tadiko was constantly surprising me with its behavior, and doing things that I didn't expect that were both positive and negative. I never once felt like I was in control of Tadiko, at least not any more than I feel like I'm in control of my surprisingly obedient cat. But what slowed me down more than Tadiko misbehaving or getting distracted was the constant breaks I would take to pet the beast after it showed growing intelligence or bravery. This game managed the monumental feat of truly capturing the totally abstract blur of thought and emotion that is growing up with an animal by your side. All the good and all the bad distilled tastefully into a roughly 13 hour experience, all while doing some other very cool things with its world. Things that any Famitsu Ueda fans will appreciate. So anyways, on to how the relationship with Deco grows over the game. The first thing I really want to drive home is the fear, which is fitting because that's what the game starts with too. You wake up locked in a room with the beast chained to the floor. It's starving, wounded, and it doesn't trust you whatsoever. Basically, any interaction with it results in it violently thrashing, sending your character flying off of it. All I knew for sure at this point in the game was that I wanted to help the wounded creature, but that I sure as hell wasn't going anywhere near its mouth. You're terrified of this thing, but you know that it needs your help, and you need its. You have the mental capacity to understand that even though the two of you are enemies, you're going to need to work together to get through this. The beast, however, clearly doesn't understand that fact, at least not yet. However, after pulling the spear out of its back and giving it time to rest, you eventually earn enough of its trust to retrieve some food for it, and while it won't eat with you near it, you're at least doing something to help it regain its strength. All you're really hoping, once you get invested in this scene, is that the beast can recognize that you don't mean it harm, and that it won't instantly kill you as soon as it's able to move again. Well, it certainly comes close. Even if you release it from its change, Tadiko can't stand up until you remove the final spear from its shoulder, and when you do, the pain causes it to knock you into a wall, knocking you out cold again. Now we're unconscious, trapped in a room with this horrifying monster facing us, desperate to regain its strength by eating. At this point, we have no idea how intelligent Tadiko is. Is it able to recognize that we're the ones who brought it food, and that we wanted to help it by pulling out the spears, even though that caused it pain? Does it even recognize that we're alive, and not just a threatening object? Well, when Tadiko nudges us awake, probably after realizing that it's still too weak to get to the next bit of food on its own, our fears are partly set aside. It either doesn't see us as something it can feed on, or it recognizes that we can be helpful to it. So it at least has basic pattern recognition, even if it hasn't really shown any emotion towards us. It's terrifying, but with its broken wings and horns looking like aviator's goggles, it's kind of cute, and it brings out a caring instinct in us. While we really just want to escape wherever we are, we can at least sympathize with the beast, even if it does scare us. I've never been a dog person, always preferring cats, but this taps into a fear of animals that is especially inherent to dogs, seeing as they're much more powerful than house cats. Every single time I pet my old dog, no matter how much affection he showed, there would always be a part of my mind fearfully wondering just what he was thinking. You constantly hear stories about dogs attacking people, even their masters, after years of being with them. We like to imagine that our animals love us, but who's to say that they aren't thinking solely about themselves when they're being affectionate? They could just be using us for the convenient food and scratching, and have no feelings towards us outside of that. I'd even say that that's the most likely. 
This cat is incredibly affectionate towards me, always choosing to sleep in my bed or on a pile of clothes with my scent. She bugs me to no end constantly when she wants my attention, and she knows how to communicate her needs to me if she's out of food or wants to be let out without using her cat door. I can carry her however I want or even put my hands around her neck, and she just purrs without fail. I've got a dream relationship with this cat, but she still attacks me at least once a month. I'll be petting her as she sits in my lap for 30 minutes, then at one point a switch will just flip. She doesn't want to be pet anymore, and she'd rather just bite my hand or swipe at me with her paw than just leave. So, even as it's never prominent enough for me to act on it, there's always going to be a part of my mind that's worried that I'm going to have an itchy scratch on my hand for the next few hours. Who's to say that this cat actually cares about me whatsoever? I bring the food, I scratch better than she can, and I do those things more when she acts cute and affectionately. I can't possibly know what she's thinking, even as I constantly keep her within mauling distance of my hands and face. Animals are scary no matter how much they mean to you, and The Last Guardian taps into that so beautifully. We never once know exactly what Toriko is thinking, even later in the game as it saves our life countless times. Is it just because we bring the food and the scratches? It's hard to say until the ending, which, to put it simply, was not at all what I was expecting. While we're on the subject of fear, I'd like to jump ahead to one other moment before returning back to the beginning. It's easy to get attached to Toriko, it's intimidating, but it's incredibly cute at the same time with those horns and broken wings. So we might lose sight of the fear we're meant to have for it, if not for one little detail that comes up in the earlier parts of the game. The boy even says in his narration that he wasn't afraid of the beast at this point. We're entering big spoiler territory now, so last chance to get out. While I had been interested in this game since long before it came out, I kept it a mystery to myself, and that sure paid off, as it was the only game I picked up when I finally got my PS4. Alright, on to the spoilers. Tadiko is some sort of construct, a chimera, a cyborg, I don't know, but its original ancestor was either built or conjured. Be it magic that powers it, or circuitry, it works like a computer. This becomes more obvious as you get towards the end of the game, but the first indication of this is in this area. It's a sort of combination satellite dish and cage, with a beacon in the middle. When you approach this area, Tadiko becomes completely transfixed, like a cat that's just spotted a bird outside the window. Then, when you jump down and call for it, it follows you, and its horns pick up on a signal from this beacon. Its eyes turn red as they do when it spots a threat, and while you can try to run away, you can only dodge for so long before Tadiko just swallows you whole. This isn't even a game over. This is the story proceeding as intended. We eventually wake up outside of the beast, with it sleeping in the same spot. There are two possible intentions behind whatever order Tadiko suddenly received from the beacon. While ultimately children like you are taken to the top of the tower to have their light energy turned into food for the guardians and the master of the valley, and their dark energy used to power the master's weapons, Tadiko wasn't able to fly that far with its wings wounded, so it either realized it couldn't complete its order and sort of crashed as a result, causing it to heave you back up, or its order was to simply swallow your mirror so that you'd be more defenseless, and unable to access the top of the tower. It's not at all unheard of for animals to quote unquote glitch out, so the metaphor stands. What's more important though is that Tadiko, who was being more and more friendly to you up until this point, suddenly turned on you, simply due to its programming demanding it, not unlike a beloved animal suddenly attacking you. This only happens about 45 minutes into the game, right when we're starting to think we can trust Tadiko. Even if you are thinking of it as this cutesy video game companion pet, and aren't thinking at all that it could ever betray you, from this moment on you just never quite feel safe around the thing, even as it saves you over and over. Especially when its eyes suddenly go red, and you aren't sure why. The loud howls it constantly lets out also make it seem like Tadiko is angry with you, even when it isn't. It's sort of the curse of the animal, really. No matter what they feel or what feelings we humans attach to them, they're ultimately just slaves to their programming. Nothing more. In spite of all of this, I love the hell out of Tadiko. I could easily see myself naming my next cat after it. So, we've established how we're made to sympathize with and want to help Tadiko, and how we're made to fear it. Well, how do we come to rely on it, play with it, and trust it with our life time and time again? Firstly, let's cover the cute stuff. Going back, as we're trying to escape the dungeon in the beginning, we come across some water, and we learn that Tadiko is afraid of it. Seeing it wanting to follow us, but being scared of the water is just plain adorable. We get it to face its fears by showing it that we have a tree. It jumps down, the splash potentially knocking us down as we stand on the platform. Then, maybe you hop onto its back as it climbs up onto land again, and get violently thrown around as it shakes the water from its feathers. I'm going to hold my tongue and try to quit dedicating entire sentences to exclaiming how cute Tadiko is. The footage speaks for itself. Anyways, as we manage to leave this dungeon about 20 minutes into the game, the boy says goodbye to Tadiko in cutscene, and then leaves it behind, as there's no exit big enough for it to fit through. 
Well, we walk forward a little bit, and Tadigo makes an incredibly high jump to get over the wall. The highest we'll see it make for a long time, as its wings are still broken. Then it's outside with us, and it lets out this cry as it sees the landscape around it. Probably sad that it can't fly around its home. Every time I've ever seen a dog for the first time in a while, I give it a little pet for a few seconds, maybe throw it its ball, and the next thing I know it's been 45 minutes and I'm forced to just ignore the dog as it puts its ball at my feet over and over, or tries to get me to keep petting it. The same goes for my cats, and apparently the same goes for Tadiko, as it'll stop at nothing to keep following you once you feed it a couple times. What's more is that when Tadiko jumps over the wall, it initially ignores us and rushes towards the cliff as we chase after it. I'm sure every single one of us who's played the game had the split second thought of, oh god, what did I just unleash on this world? What's more interesting though is that with Tadiko being more interested in its freedom than it is us, we're made to question its intentions yet again. I'm certain that if it could still fly, it would just leave here and now, possibly with us in its mouth, and that would be the last we ever saw of it. However, I'd like to be done talking about our fear of the beast for now, so let's go back a little bit and focus on how cute it is that Tadiko follows us outside of the cave, and once it realizes it can't fly or get help, it decides to keep following us, immediately opting to traverse this incredibly suspect obstacle course just to keep up with us. Sure, it might just be doing so because we were its best hope of staying alive, but it's so crippled compared to how powerful it clearly was at one point that it's impossible to not feel sympathy and attachment for it. Moving forward, we solve some more platforming challenges with Tadiko's help, and by this point we've probably realized that we can throw Tadiko barrels, and it'll attempt to catch them in its mouth, with about a 50% success rate. It's absolutely adorable when it does catch them, but it's also a little heartbreaking when it fails, and from Tadiko's perspective, we just threw a barrel at its face for no reason, not unlike tripping on a cat in the dark. Tadiko lets out a little whimper, and we feel awful about it. So we continue to passively grow our bond with Tadiko as we explore, and we manage to get to that satellite cage room I mentioned earlier. Tadiko swallows us, then we wake up on the ground to find it passed out with its tail dangling over the edge. With no way forward, this is when the game first demonstrates just how helpful Tadiko's tail is when used as a rope. We climb down it and traverse forward a little bit, and then Tadiko wakes up just in time to save us from the first set of shadow children we encounter. By the way, I do call these Shadow Children. I'll explain my fan theory on the connection between the Ueda games a bit later, but for now, just take my word. These are the same creatures we fight in Nico. Just look inside their armor. Anyways, what's more relevant here is that we climb down to Nico's tail. Moving forward, we get our introduction to what I'll call the incense mechanic, an aroma that Tadiko will basically be forced to move towards. Using this to our advantage reminds me of using a treat to trick an animal into the bathroom so you can lock it in there for whatever reason. A sad feeling, but right after this puzzle, Tadiko goes ahead a bit, leaving its tail swaying below for us to grab onto and climb up. It watches us with interest as we climb its tail. Then, after we see what looks like a second guardian, we come across a puzzle that we can only solve by using Tadiko's tail. So why is this tail thing any more meaningful than, say, Ravenholm in Half-Life 2, where mechanics are introduced naturally, then expanded upon to make puzzles and set pieces come up organically? Well, in that scenario, only the player is learning. Here, both you and Tadiko are learning. It never even occurred to it that someone could use its tail as a rope. Once it sees this trick at this section, this is quickly followed up by a puzzle whose first step has two solutions. We could either hop on Tadiko's back and have it jump up here, or we could have it jump up and then we can use its tail to climb to the higher ground. Tadiko sees this solution, and excited to get a grasp on this new tail climbing idea, it seemingly refuses to jump up unless you climb this tower and commit yourself to the tail climbing solution, even though it's less efficient. Why am I going into so much detail about something so subtle? Well, this is the first example we see of Tadiko genuinely learning and showing curiosity. Whereas we've mostly been manipulating it up until this point, at this section it actively halts our progress so that it can try out a new trick, even though it isn't necessarily the fastest way to get to the next bit of food or to the next petting session. That second tail climb is also when I started to notice just how much Tadiko was paying attention to me. It would constantly be looking over its shoulder at me or watching me whenever I had to leave it behind to look ahead. It keeps a really close eye on you most of the time, which I read as a combination of affection and parent-like worry for your safety. It seems like it's always ready to catch you if you fall, and while this behavior starts out subtle, it becomes impossible to ignore as the bond grows. While we of course use this tail climbing mechanic throughout the whole game, this moment of realization for Tadiko is paid off at this scene, when it catches us from our death using its tail, showing that it really has learned something. One thing worth pointing out before we move on is that soon after this point we gain the ability to give Tadiko more specific commands. Jump, push, stop that, look there, etc. Anyways, a bit later we see a stained glass eye on the ground, and Tadiko's eyes turn red. 
It won't move forward, and it basically refuses to take its eyes off of it. Whatever this thing is, it seems like it was made to control the Guardians. We push it off the cliff, and Nico looks at us like we're a god. It's completely amazed that we're capable of destroying these things, and with this, Tadiko starts becoming much more proactive with its platforming. From this point on, more often than not, it will find the next platform to jump to before you even see it, and it will initiate these jumps without the player's guidance much more often. By this point, it's getting more comfortable with the idea that the two of you are working together. It's starting to trust you, and when you look through a lot of the subtlety of its actions, you might realize that, in some respects, it's having a harder time trusting you than you are it. Anyways, a bit further along and Tadiko starts playing with this chain dangling from the ceiling. While this is an inadvertent on Tadiko's part, this both shows us the way forward and, with this door shifting slightly as the chain is tugged, hints at the next puzzle, whose solution involves pulling on that chain to open the door. And of course, it's absolutely adorable. We climb the chain and grab a vase full of that incense stuff, and use it to make Tadiko pull harder on the chain, allowing us to wedge the door open so it can pass through. More of that outright manipulation of Tadiko that tugs at our heartstrings a bit. Then, as with the platforming, Tadiko starts to exhibit some new behavior. We hop onto its leg here to climb up, and Tadiko lifts its leg to make the climb a little bit easier. From this point on, it slowly adopts more of these behaviors, lowering its head to make it easier to get on, and eventually doing things like catching us as we fall and throwing us onto its back. While Tadiko started paying a bit more attention to us earlier on, it seems like between this and the more proactive platforming on its part, it's starting to learn better and better how to work with us, and predict what we would like it to do. Not to say that it ever loses the sense of having its own agenda, as all animals do. A bit later on, something comes up that I'd like to ask you guys about, and hear your takes on this. We see two more of these stained glass eyes, and once we smash them, Tadiko examines the remains with curiosity. A very nice touch. But as far as smashing them goes, you're meant to throw this helmet at them. However, on my first playthrough, after trying for minutes to smash them or climb them without throwing anything, I went back and spotted these viscous orbs behind Deco, and I threw those at the glass to break it instead of the helmet. On my second playthrough, the orbs were nowhere to be found. They look a lot like the gel that the Chosen Ones are submerged in when the Guardians heave them up, so my question is, is that what I think it is? And if so, why do we only see it at this moment in the game when Tadiko stays staring at the eyes for a long period? Uh, moving on. For the next while of the game, we have moments that are a strong combination of much less subtle bond building and emotional resonance being drawn from that bond. Suffice it to say that the behavior Tadiko starts exhibiting becomes more and more complicated with its growing confidence in itself and in the boy. It catches you when you fall, it comes running to your rescue, and we get plenty of opportunities to help it out by destroying stained glass eyes, even encountering what I can only describe as an aerial maze of them, whose purpose must be to keep the Guardians from interfering with the more humanoid-centric architecture below. Throughout the whole game, these outdoor sections host most of the exciting set pieces, and many of the more emotional moments, as Tadiko gets to make longer and longer jumps, showing us how much it's healed thanks to us. We're asked to trust it as it catches us in its mouth for the first time in this life or death situation, and at one point, Tadiko is carrying us, and our shirt collar tears, forcing Tadiko to catch us with its tail as we fall. And we eventually get to this incredibly heavy moment when we're forced to leave Tadiko on this single column with nowhere to escape to. While we're exploring alone, we're forced to evade Shadow Children without Tadiko to help us, and by the time we get to see it again, it's being attacked by Shadow Children, throwing spears at it from the building we're in, and it's completely defenseless to stop it. After seeing this, we really kick it into gear, and eventually lower the bridge so that Tadiko can get away from its attackers. It settles in this beautiful grassy oasis, and refuses to move until we get it some food. It's impossible to not feel bad during this scene. Tadiko has been nothing but loyal to us, save for that attack that it was forced to launch against us, and it probably doesn't understand why we have to abandon it here, just like a dog seemingly thinks that when you leave for work in the morning, you'll never come back. Anyways, moving on to a happier moment, while I didn't realize that this is what was happening on my first playthrough, I recently noticed that in this room, we actually used the light of Tadiko's eyes to navigate this dark corridor full of pitfalls, which I just wanted to mention because I think it's a very nice touch. Especially considering that Tadiko's eyes don't glow by default, so it must have been doing this consciously to help us. By this point, the bond between Tadiko and the boy is pretty powerful, and you feel invincible whenever this thing is near you. However, as we move ahead, Tadiko is eventually attacked by another guardian, confirming that that is indeed what we saw earlier, and that Tadiko isn't truly the last guardian. Tadiko falls off this building, into a room we were in much earlier, a lot of progress lost. We wake up hanging from a tree branch, Tadiko breathing heavily slumped on the floor. Through our shouting, we eventually wake it up and get it to land on the platform above us so we can grab onto its tail and free ourselves. When you climb its tail and see its face again, you might just realize that its horns have grown considerably since the last time you thought about it. 
While the game probably did this earlier when Tadiko swallowed us, at this point I start to suspect that the game is using these unconscious time-lapse transitions to add a bit of length to Tadiko's horns and its wingspan, without having to pull tricks to obscure these transitions during gameplay. Although, its lack of armor and innocent yet uniquely soulless eyes still bring out that sympathy we've had for the beast since the beginning, especially considering one of them is turned off, so to speak. No light comes from it whatsoever. We also see the Shadow Children getting a bit more clever, as they start using these eyes to lure the boy away from Tadiko, setting us up for an ambush. They've done this before, but the traps are getting more and more elaborate, proving that this isn't just a coincidence. They're setting up these eyes in our path as we move along. We aren't just cleaning up defenses, we're actively fighting, and trying to outpace the Shadow Children's preparations. One of these traps involves separating the boy from Tadiko and trapping us in this long, narrow hallway where we're ambushed by them. Seeing that we don't have enough time to open the latch on this door, Tadiko smashes through it, and as the walkway starts collapsing, we're forced to leave it behind, desperately hoping that it'll be okay, but not having time to ensure it ourselves. And as we make this jump that's clearly just wishful thinking, Tadiko grabs us mid-air and eventually lands on a platform, before casually throwing us over its head so that we land on its back, as if it isn't even aware that we just left it to die. All of the most obvious examples of Tadiko getting smarter are in moments like this, when all hope is lost and we get to be surprised by a new behavior of it. Powerful and smart as it is now, Tadiko still has some growing to do. Over these next sections, we see it turn a gear in a wall to raise a gate, and even operate a seesaw to catapult us upward. All capped off by it using the wake of its splashing to help us reach a platform that the water isn't high enough for us to reach normally. Although, it could be debated whether this was a conscious act of cleverness on Tadiko's part, or merely it trying to get closer to us. Anyways, after Tadiko overestimates how long we can hold our breath, we pass out and float upwards without it realizing that we've been separated. We follow a trail upward and see some feathers spread across the ground. Hopefully Tadiko wasn't hurt. Eventually, we see a tail hanging through the floorboards, and while my first instinct was that it was the other guardian, as of my second playthrough, I think it was meant to hint that Tadiko was wounded, as it doesn't respond to our calls. Either way, we walk a bit further and find that it is the other guardian, and it wants us dead. Long story short, we end up in a cage, safe at last when the guardian is summoned back to the tower. After a long wait, Tadiko comes back and helps us open the cage again, in a way that must have been incredibly painful for the boy, but essential nonetheless. Needless to say, I nearly pet Tadiko into a coma once I was finally out of the cage. As we move forward, we have to get back to where we were attacked by the other guardian, and when we get there, Tadiko insists on smelling the other beast's lair, much like a real animal would. And due to the danger of the other guardian returning, we have to get Tadiko to let it go and take us away. Again, even this late in the game, Tadiko is still acting as its own animal, and it will still sometimes take coaxing to get it to do what we want. As we move forward a bit, our confidence in Tadiko almost completely revived from when it attacked us, we find another cage, and Tadiko's eyes go red again. Tadiko's eyes have gone red a dozen times since the last cage, and yet we're still able to read its mood beyond just the color of its eyes, purely because of our time with it. There must be another cage ahead. As soon as I saw Tadiko adopt this pose, I ran away from it, down the hallway, falling into the cage. Tadiko chased me, and again it swallowed me. The last time this happened, we saw a brief glimpse of a flashback, and this time we see the whole thing. Direction-wise, this has to be my favorite cutscene in gaming. We see Tadiko sneak into our bedroom back in our village, swallow us, fight off some tribals, and fly away with us. We see it get struck by lightning and come crashing down to the bottom of the nest, and we see the Shadow Children carry it down to the dungeon and chain it up, leaving it to die. This is when Tadiko heaves us up, and where we wake up in the beginning of the game. With this, the boy realizes that we're in the nest, where the Guardians take the so-called Chosen Ones. Then, in one of the saddest moments in gaming, Tadiko wakes up to find the boy lying on the ground, limp, and it lays our body first on the cold ground, then out in the sun, then, finally, it drops us face first in the water, waking us up from our unconsciousness. And Tadiko jumps around with pure joy when it sees that we're still alive.
As we move forward, we eventually manage to get onto the tower, the highest structure in the place, which is important both because it's where the Guardian's orders are being sent from, and because it's the only thing high enough for Tadiko to have a chance of jumping out of the valley with its wings as damaged as they are. What's more interesting though is that when we finally get to see the tower's walls up close, it looks unnatural. More so than the stone structures we've been navigating up until this point. It almost looks sci-fi, like some sort of hyper-advanced race built this structure. When I first saw this, I was instantly reminded of the mirror room, where we first got the mirror that controls Rodiko's tail in the beginning. This device and this tower are totally out of place compared to the rest of the game's architecture, and that'll be explained by the end. By the way, if, like me, you were curious as to why we find the mirror such a valuable tool in a dungeon at the bottom of the valley, I can only assume it's because the mirror only works on our Tudiko, and so it was retired with it. Presumably, every guardian has its own mirror that can be wielded when necessary. As we near the top of the tower, we get another action scene that I'll dig into more later, but the main point of it is that Tudiko and the boy are sent back down again. We climb up a bit further, and that other guardian shows up again, attacking Tudiko within inches of its life. What's more important for now is that Tadiko is now able to make incredibly long jumps, stopping just short of full-on flying. Once we give it some nourishment, Tadiko's tail now shoots full-blown lasers instead of lightning. Lasers which we meaningfully use to destroy eyes, and even more meaningfully, the beacon in the next cage before Tadiko turns on us. We climb a bit more until we're almost as high as the tower's top, and Tadiko managed to full-on fly for the first time in the entire game. It clearly still can't do it well, but it's actually able to gain height for a moment there, past that of the initial jump. Well, now we're on the bridge approaching the flat surface of the tower, and we have to leave Tadiko behind to do some platforming, and push these two eye statues out of the way. As we do this, more shadow children than we've ever seen before come out of the tower to ambush us, and while we have time to push the first eye off of the bridge, the shadow children's spell quickly paralyzes us to the point where we can't even turn the camera. And when they grab us, Tadiko faces its fear of the eyes for the only time in the entire game, jumping across the bridge to fight the Shadow Children, and keeping the battle up for almost 10 minutes before they're all dispelled. So, after a bit of runaround that we'll get into later, we're finally on the walkable surface of this sci-fi tower. And once we get inside using the mirror as a key, we find that the ground is covered in fog, and that we can see the boy's breath. Instantly, I thought, this is a coolant tower, which is confirmed a few minutes later. We solve a puzzle involving dangling Tadiko's tail through a hole in the floor so that we can use it as a rope, and as a gun in this area that the rest of Tadiko can't reach, and we get to the Master of the Valley. The strange ball of energy. If you're like me, you probably assumed that this was some sort of transcendent being, like the Queen in Eco, or Dorman in Shadow of the Colossus. However, without any way to damage it, we climb past it and we find this giant fan. That's when it's confirmed that this is indeed a coolant tower, and why would you need a coolant tower here? We're entering big fan theory mode, so for a moment I'm probably going to sound like a lunatic to someone who hasn't played all three UEDA games, but here goes. So why would you need a coolant tower here? It's because the master of the valley is an AI, and this entire tower is its heatsink. Now, I'm not saying there isn't any magic involved, as it's able to use spells on you to sap your vigor, and as an upcoming scene alludes to, it feeds on the light energy from the quote-unquote chosen ones like yourself. We see that the boys are captured using the guardians, and then some or most of their light energy is put inside of the barrels that we've been feeding to Nico up until now. So I should clarify, where in the Ueda trilogy does it say that beings have light and dark energy? Before I move on, I should point out that a lot of the following theory is inspired by Max Durat's video, Team Eco Shared Universe Theory. However, there are some things in that video that I'd like to expand upon, and others that I disagree with. So, as we see in Shadow of the Colossus, Dorman's soul is made up of light energy and dark energy. When its soul was split up into the 16 Colossi, the light energy was used to give the Colossi life, and the dark energy was used to give them offensive capability. This is why the Colossi bleed black, but have glowing teal under their skin and in their eyes. They have much more dark energy in them than light energy, and the excess light energy was put into these statues, which, as Dorman states, are the thing that actually keeps it from using its full power to revive the girl. So again, light energy is used for healing and defense, while dark energy is used for offense. This is why, as Wonder absorbs the dark energy from the Colossi, he becomes more dangerous, with improved grip strength meaning he can deliver more powerful sword blows, but he also becomes so weak that he can barely stand up by the end of the game. 
His ratio of light energy to dark energy is so far from the perfect 50-50 he started with, and so he's basically dead until he absorbs the light energy from the Guardians, meaning that he's now back to 50-50, and has the entirety of Dormant Soul inside of him. Moving back to the last Guardian, we see that the light energy from the Chosen Ones, represented by Cyan, is used to give life to the Guardians, seeing as they feed on it, and is used to power the Master of the Valley, as evidenced by its Cyan core. So, what are the Chosen One's dark energies used for? Well, again, offense. It's what powers the Master's only direct weapon, its pulsing attack that can only be fought with the light energy of the Mirror Shield, its light energy's defensive nature. This is, of course, similar to the ending of Eco, when we use the light energy of the Queen's Sword to defend us from her pulsing shadow attack. Well, if each soul has a 50-50 ratio of light and dark energy, then what are the rest of the Chosen One's dark energies going to? The creation of Shadow Children. In Eco, the Queen was using these coffin-like machines to extract the energy of the Horn Boys. She used their light energy to keep herself alive long enough to attempt to put her soul into Yorda, and used their dark energy to create Shadow Children for offense. And this is more or less exactly what the Master of the Valley does. Ueda has confirmed that Shadow of the Colossus is a prequel to Eco. As for whether the girl in Shadow is the queen in Eco, there isn't enough evidence, but I think it only makes sense that The Last Guardian takes place after Eco. As this whole setup with the Master of the Valley having invented guardians to capture children and extract their dark energy is essentially just a much more streamlined version of what the queen was doing in Eco. You could even say that the Master, and this entire control tower, is just a modern day version of these rooms filled with tombs that extracted the soul energy from Horn Boys. It's just an upgraded version of that room, and this time it has an AI controlling it. So, with that somewhat irrelevant theory rambling done, I've got one last story to tell before I move on to the ending. I was house-sitting for one of my old teachers for a bit over a week recently, and by far the most interesting part of the experience was getting to know the pets. They had two llamas, an older dog, and a kitten that couldn't have been more than eight months old. The dog was immediately trusting, and I still can't get a read on how the llamas feel, but the cat was pretty scared of me at first. When I first got there, I reached down behind the couch to plug in my PlayStation, and I saw the cat for the first time, hiding under the couch. As soon as I noticed her, she retreated to deeper under the couch, and I didn't see much more of her until it was time for her to eat. I filled up her bowl, and we went our separate ways, and eventually she came upstairs to where I was playing my games, and started meowing at me. Her bowl was still 70% full, but she wanted it 80% full, and I happily obliged and started really petting her for the first time. After a day or two like this, it had gotten to the point that whenever I was eating or doing anything downstairs, she was there trying to get my attention. Eventually, I'd earned enough of her trust that she let me pick her up, and after calming her down by speaking softly and petting her, I was able to slowly walk around with her, and she wasn't scared that I would drop her anymore, so long as I moved slowly enough. After the first week, I had taken the dog out for a walk, and when I got back, the door was open. The kitten had gotten out, and I was terrified. I walked around outside, calling her name, and after a few seconds, she ran out from under the staircase where she was hiding, and practically jumped into my arms before I opened the door and got her back inside. If the people I was house-sitting for somehow end up watching this, I'm sorry that she got out, but the feeling I had throughout my time with this cat is exactly what The Last Guardian managed to capture so perfectly. What's more, I had forgotten the cat's name, and so I'd taken to calling her Tadiko, and when I saw her real name on one of the notes left for me by the homeowners, I stuck with Tadiko. That might not be her name, but I think she'll always associate the sound of it with me. As I was packing up, getting ready to leave, I picked up Tadiko, and I walked downstairs with her. Changing elevation was always what scared her the most when I held her, so I hadn't tried this before, but by moving slowly enough, holding her tight and whispering that name, Tadiko, over and over, I managed to carry her down the staircase. Bonding with something that can't speak your language is somehow more meaningful and visceral than speaking with someone who you can understand. It's like the words only serve to muddy up where you two stand, whereas you have to show your feelings to bond with an animal. So, now I have nothing left that I feel like I need to cover, except for the two most powerful moments of the game for me. The ending, and a section I skipped past earlier, just so I could save it for here. When Tadiko was attacked by the other guardians on these bridges, I frantically did all I could to help it survive the fight, and eventually the two of us had managed to wound the enemy enough for it to leave. Tadiko was lying on the floor, panting, and it heaved up the mirror shield that it had taken from us so much earlier. I used the mirror to point Tadiko's lightning at anything that looked breakable, worried that I might be hurting Tadiko further by harnessing the mirror's power, and I managed to knock down a barricade up above. I was thinking that it was just a way for me to progress, but I was desperately hoping that it was hiding a barrel or two for Tadiko. As I climbed up the chain, I was getting more and more convinced that this was the last I was going to see of it, and again, I was still expecting a tragic ending. So once I had finished the climb, I jumped back down and pet Tadiko for a solid two minutes or more, 
Once I said my goodbyes, I started climbing the chain again and realized that there was nothing up here but a couple of barrels, not a way out. So I brought the barrels to Deco and used its lightning to access a couple more that were in a minecart suspended in the wreckage above. I fed the rest of the barrels to Tadiko, and with it showing no signs of getting better, I just kept on petting it until the screen faded to black. Upon fading back in, the boy was sleeping against Tadiko's feathers when its head came in from the side of the frame to look at the boy waking him up. This may very well be the most relieved I've ever been in a story. I was expecting a tragic ending to this game, as in Ueda's last game, Shadow of the Colossus, so all of Tadiko's near-death experiences really hit home for me. I was expecting the game to end with its death. What was essentially just another point-and-click puzzle had me on a roller coaster of emotions that few, if any, games have managed to match. I started out afraid of this thing, and at this moment in the game I still wasn't completely sure of its motivations, but if it had died here, it would have literally ruined my whole day. Well, after a lot of recovery into Deco and a lot of climbing back to the top, we eventually get to the top of the tower, the one place in the entire nest where we can see over the wall and into the outside world. The master is still functioning, but that's not why we came here, we just want to leave. When we get up here, we find Tadiko staring off into the sunset, and the boy quickly joins him. But before we can make our escape, the master sets off a beacon, and countless guardians come from all over to land on the platform with us. This is where we learn just what's inside of those barrels we've been feeding Tadiko. Needless to say, the guardians gang up on and utterly annihilate Tadiko, even going so far as to rip off its tail, throwing it near the master's chamber. We're able to drag it into view of the master and use the mirror to fire lasers at it, destroying the master once and for all. With this, all of the guardians go into a daze and fall off the tower, many of them dying, and just a few managing to find a foothold, just staving off the inevitable loss of control that was inflicted on the other guardians. But Todiko stays in control of itself, either because its horns broke, or because it found a new master whose love could drive it. But with the master's destruction, its spells overwhelm us, and Todiko finds us passed out in its chamber. It picks us up and finally manages to fly out of the nest, before crash landing in our village and heaving us up in front of our chief. The last little bit of control we have in the game is raising our arm and mumbling to Dodiko that it has to leave if it wants to live, as the tribals would just continue to hurt it further. It has to go back to the only place it can hope to find food for itself, the nest. The mixed feelings you have towards your time with Dodiko aren't just expressed in cutscene and set piece, they're woven into the basic concepts of the gameplay. It never feels good to manipulate an animal, whether it's my example earlier of tricking a house pet to go into the bathroom so you can lock it in there for whatever reason, or chasing a terrified chicken so that it'll go back into its fenced enclosure. Sure, it's for the animal's own good, but they don't understand that. They just see it as a betrayal from this thing that usually signifies food or scratches. Well, pretty much everything we do with Rico over the game can best be described as manipulation, save for petting and removing spears. Whether it's calling the beast when we're in danger, using the incense to lure it into a specific spot where we need it, coercing it to make a jump, or of course getting it to fight for us, we're constantly inconveniencing this animal for our own gain. While it's only thanks to our cooperation that Tadiko and the boy are able to make it out of the valley, there's no denying that Tadiko had a worse ending than the boy did. I mean the last line of the whole game is the narrator saying that Tadiko doesn't have a long time to live, after it flies us back to the village so that we can live on. While it does eventually reproduce and live on to be a parent, there's no denying that Tadiko would have lived longer if the boy had died right here after destroying the Master of the Valley. Then there's the unavoidable fact that once there are no more barrels in the nest, Tadiko and its offspring will almost definitely have to go back to stealing children, which I'm all but certain will lead to Tadiko choosing to starve itself rather than kill more. The Last Guardian has an ending that mostly seems bittersweet at first, but that gets more and more bitter the longer you think about it. The Last Guardian may seem like a slow burn to the outside observer, but literally every section of the game serves to further the complex relationship between you and Tadiko. And by the time it was over, I had more sympathy for Tadiko than I have for any fictional character I've ever encountered.
I'd like to thank you guys for bearing with me while I slow down production to hopefully cure my vertigo. Hopefully such a long video was worth the wait. I'm definitely not fixed yet, but it is getting better with some changes to my lifestyle I'm making. And the next step is visiting an ENT, which I've already gotten scheduled for. Wish me luck.